David Gray and Babylon on Wave 105. It's exactly ten past eleven. Good morning, this is Mark Collins, and my guest this morning is David Gray. Good morning, David. How are Hello you? Hello there. Um, lovely to see you again. Thank you. The reason I say again is because the reason I played that song as well. Back in May, you played live for us at uh, Wave 105 Live. I did, yeah. And you played that song acoustically. Yeah. And you had the whole of the BIC singing along with you in the palm of your hand. They were lively. They were very lively. And and every year, we, we do Wave 105 Live every year. And every year, there's there's one song that just gets everybody sort of like going or is, is a memorable song and last year it was Babylon oh. the year before it was Travis and why does it always rain on me great because everybody stood up and sung that great when you hear that song on the radio what do you think yeah I think I think it sounds it stands up That's, I'm, I'm checking the mix every time one of my songs appears I, I, as the person who made it I, I, I listen to the the way that it's been put together and whether it still sounds genuine so i don't know I, that's what it's like being the person who made it i'm always checking it so uh, it sometimes sounds really weird but like the sound of my voice you think is that me yeah you know there's a certain detachment from it because some some singers do sound like that they sing like they sound you don't do you no i guess the, the, my singing voice is something different it's hidden most of the time and now this big bellow comes as soon as i get you know up on stage <laughs> And you were talking about walking into a shop and <laughs> hearing did, yeah. it. You could explain the story. Just a couple of days ago, yeah, I was actually buying some light bulbs, which is how exciting life can <laughs> become when you, you know, when you make it. Yeah, uh, and rock and roll. As I stepped up to order them, their specific light bulb for a fancy light fitting that I've got. On came Babylon. The moment I opened my mouth, it just started from the speaker above our heads. So, uh, yeah, I was thinking of the PRS as I pocketed the light bulbs and left the shop. <laughs> so then playing that song, Pay For Your Light Bulb. It could have done. You yeah, probably could have. Yeah. Some of them. Yeah. They were expensive. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I bought in bulk. <laughs> I don't like going to shops. No. <laughs> I hate shopping. <laughs> Four years between albums. Um, that's quite a long time away from your fans, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I, I haven't been, I haven't been asleep during that time, or sitting on a beach in the south of France. More's the pity. <laughs> I was, uh, I was working for most of it. This there was, uh, there was definitely a, a bit of slowing down going on because I had two records in quick succession that I toured very heavily, particularly in America. So for most of 2009, 2010, and half of 2011, I was basically out on the road. So after that, you do want to recuperate and actually have some life that you that will then be relative to the, mu the music that you're making. So there's an element of slowing down, but I, I mean, I, this time round was more problematic making the record because I didn't want to make the same record I'd made before, and I, I knew that. And it was about finding a new way, and that took a bit of time and essentially involved finding a producer, somebody to help me, and getting the right person and finding what it was I was looking for. I knew all the things I didn't want, but I wasn't sure what it was I wanted. It took some time. So there's a lot of trial and error. There was a couple of big recording sessions that ended up not being used. And then I found Andy Barlow, and things began to click, and we had a good sort of nine months making the record, and then, of course, you finish it off and master it, and then it's finally the right moment to come out, so it, it ends up being quite a long time. But, and yeah. you went to Andy with about, what, 30-odd songs? Or I did, yeah, more? well, a huge bag of songs, probably even more than that. Um, but we, we ended up not using most of those. He was reluctant to dip into the bag, because I think when something's made and cast and written and has an authority about it, it's harder to break it open and change it. And what we were looking for was change. So whether he felt this instinctively or consciously, I, I don't know, but he, he steered me towards songs that I was still in the process of putting together. Uh, or even just really embryonic ideas. He, he sort of pushed me away from the bag of pre-made material towards stuff that I, even I didn't know quite which way it was going to go. Because I felt he probably felt it was a level playing field then and he could ha really have some input and really affect what happened the sound of the song the way it was arranged so uh, that anyway that was that's a bit of how the process worked but it was it was all consuming when we got into it and yes it's left me with a surplus of material that i i haven't used up yet so i don't know what's going to happen to that well, the album is called Mutineers, um, and I've heard you say, because if you go onto your, uh, your website, there's, you, you talk about different tracks on the album oh, as yeah. well, and the, and the making of Mutineers as well with Andy. 
and uh, it seems that that it's a, a happier album than previous albums. Are you? Um, did you start off being a grumpy old man, and now you're becoming a, a really happy old man? No, no sadly, uh, <laughs> six months on the road has brought me right back to oh, the beginning. Oh, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Thank God. No, for I'm that. just as miserable now as I ever was. Yeah. <laughs> Cue the Smiths. Can um, I join, um, your, <laughs> join your club? Uh, so no, I mean, I think making this record, I, I sort of, as I started writing for it a few years back, I was sitting there and writing songs it all seemed so familiar and it was like poetic you know jaded poetic observations of a sort of middle-aged man set to music and I just didn't want to be creating that I wanted a sense of epiphany and uplift and to find that I had to crack not only the music open for the excitement the rush of something new coming at you but I, I, to get that uplift I had to break myself open a bit because doing this job as relentlessly as I've pursued it over the last 15, 20 years, it sort of, it breaks you down a bit. And uh, I think it's part of getting old as well, but you kind of, you get a bit jaded and you get a bit blinkered in your vision. Mm. So it was about taking the blinkers off and getting out of the comfort zone and, and allowing something else to happen. It was an uncomfortable experience at times, but when the music did spring to life in the way that it did, there's a zest about it, an excitement of something new happening. And so I don't think it'll be so long to the next record. I think this broke a whole load of stuff open for me. And there's a whole world of creative possibilities now at my door, whereas I was just seeing dead ends three or four years ago. And another like, slight change you made is you this time, you the, the, the melodies came first and the lyrics came second, didn't they? No, that's how I usually work. It's a mixture on this record, but I, in, as part of shaking up my process... In order that something different might happen, a new nuance to what I was doing or writing, I, I began to start with a lyric and work back into music, which isn't my usual way. It sounds like an incredibly simple thing, just reversing the flow in that way. Uh, but it, it uh, sort of strangely detached me from whether what I was making was any good or not. When I, when I stumbled upon the melody second, I didn't know whether it held water properly well it really stood up as a melody whereas when usually that would come to me through the chord sequence i feel a melody and the chords and i think yeah, i'm really onto something here i've just got to find a good lyric and i'm there whereas working the other way around i had no idea whether what i was doing was any good or not so it it allowed me to to make in a slightly more detached way this all sounds very technical and it is i suppose but this when you make a lot of records you and you don't want to just repeat yourself you have to try something new and th i've been very encouraged with with some of the things that came out of that so i'll give some examples off the new record birds of the high arctic snow in vegas gulls all these things began as words and then channeled down into music and now listening to them i can't tell the difference between the the way so obviously it, it wasn't it worked it didn't disable my you know songwriting talents working mm. that way it, it just it meant that i couldn't see what i was doing i didn't know that couldn't see the wood for the trees while i was doing it which had its advantages because um there's a sort of moment of indulgence when you're writing something when it doesn't take long when you really think you've got something good and you're thinking yeah on stage glastonbury <laughs> yeah, sun's going down this is good the crowd are going wild it's like you get all these ridiculous thoughts playing through your mind whereas yeah. working the other way i just quietly got on with making something with no bluster and no sense of occasion really just using my uh, mind um, my f songwriting instincts to complete something the best I could and in, in that quiet work I did some of the best work on the record that way that's the writing process once we got into the studio and recorded it it got shaken up again Andy was was very brave in the way he cut into things and broke things down right well let's you brought your guitar with I you have, yeah. let's let's hear one of your songs an old, an old one can we start with please oh yeah you can start with an old one if you like this is that all right is, uh, I'm gonna Pick uh, the one I love because there's a kind of soldier theme to this song which seems appropriate at this moment in time. Gonna close my eyes Girl, and watch you go Running through this life, darling Like a field of snow As the tree circles
red summer's night Not a wind that breathes Just the bullets whispering gentle Amongst the new green leaves This things I might have said Only wish I could Now I'm leaking life faster And I'm leaking blood So tell the repo man And the stars above The child See no fiery hell Just the lights are bright and burning In the Bay Hotel Next wave coming in Like an ocean rock oh, Won't you take my hand now, darling On that old dance floor We could twist and Shout They're the turtled up And you're the one I love You're the one I love Yeah The one I love Yee-hee Yee-hee David Gray is my guest this morning here on Wave 105. We'll talk uh, more to David in just a second. Wave. David Gray on Wave 105, and please forgive me, he's my guest this morning. Um, David, I was watching um, one of your videos uh, the other day um, about the little noise gig that you performed at recently. Oh, yeah, that was great. Well, can you explain exactly what little noise is? It's, well, it's, uh, I think Joe Wiley set this uh, charity up as part of MenCap, basically. It was... It was helping men cap out, so the, that was where the money was going. So she asked me, would I perform? I've done it once before, a few years ago. So we we show, played a show in the Union Chapel, and Little Noise, I think, is her sort of wing of the whole thing, where they use gigs. I mean, I'm just... I'm, I'm, I'm making this up because I'm imagining this is the truth. I don't actually know if it's true. But she seems to front this part of the charity, so Little Noise is very much her domain, and she puts this string of concerts and events on each year to raise money for Mencap. So Mencap were there, and uh, it, but it was a great night. It was a really beautiful gig, that. Because it was, it was basically... Um she was talking about her first gig, and you spoke about your first oh, gig right, as yeah. well. That's and right. it's, it's to get uh, disabled kids and kids with men learning disabilities in to see music. Well, yeah, I think the, the point that was made to me that really struck home was, you know, think, through thinking about your first experience of going to a show or seeing live music, like someone you really were crazy about. So for me, the, my first gig was The Smiths when I was about 16. Uh, and Edinburgh just what Playhouse. it meant and trying to take all that in. Well, basically, for people with learning disabilities and carers, the carer clocks off at nine o'clock. Going to a gig isn't a possibility. So it's not that they wouldn't enjoy it or, you know, they couldn't handle it when they were there. It's just that it's just not on the cards. The, the money isn't there. It cuts off at nine. So just to, to raise some money, a kitty, so that a few people can have more of an experience, something that they'll take with them forever. So when you think how much music means to people, it was sort of allowing it to for everybody so that was the idea i think and that was one of the central points that was made in that video mm. and what was your first gig like seeing the smiths at the edinburgh playhouse 
it was it was crazy. I mean, it, the journey was what was really crazy because I bunked off school with my mate because his brother uh, said he had tickets for the Smiths. He was on a ship. He joined the Royal Navy uh, and had been stationed on the HMS Edinburgh in Edinburgh. And it was a lie. So he said he had <laughs> tickets to the Smiths. Like, oh, yeah, I'm going to see the Smiths tomorrow. And I, I've got a couple of spare tickets. Why don't you come? So we thought, yeah, well, we will. So we got on a train. We went to Cardiff, got up to Manchester, got all the way up to Edinburgh, called him on his ship. It was like he didn't have tickets at all. <laughs> <laughs> so we ended up buying them off a tout and got in there. I gave Morrissey my beads. He gave me some sort of buddlier kind of twigs from outside the back door of Edinburgh Playhouse. My friend invaded the stage at the wrong moment, couldn't grab Morrissey and grab the bass player and then was pounded to a pulp by a bunch of <laughs> Scottish bouncers. So that, and then we slept, slept the night on Edinburgh Station under newspaper in a photo booth. So all those things are indelibly etched into my soul. Uh, and that, it was almost like that was more of an event than the music itself. The Smiths were great, but it wasn't the same thing as listening to the record. There was only one Johnny Martin. There's about yeah. 15 guitar parts. So yeah. It wasn't quite as all-encompassing as a live sound. A year on, they'd added an extra guitarist and stuff, and The Queen Is Dead came out, but this was the Meat Is Murder tour, which I heard that in Stoke, someone threw a pound of sausages on stage <laughs> during that stage, as, a, as an aside. <laughs> so the wonders of live music should be for everyone. <laughs> That's rock and roll, that is. I had a few emails come in. Uh, Steve Holloway says, Always surprised when I hear David interviewed. Uh, seems like a quiet and unassuming man and then he sings and all that great stuff just comes out. Are you a quiet and unassuming man? I wouldn't man? describe myself as quiet. Uh, uh, maybe a little bit shy, you know, as my natural place in the world. So that's one of the reasons that being on stage is such a release for me. Yeah. It, it was just, I, I can remember the first moment of my my performance history, which was in a play where the main character, I must have been about nine or ten, dropped out on the day of the show. He was the wizard, and I had to step in as an understudy. Well, I hadn't been told any of the lines, so I had to learn the script and improvise the dance routines and the songs because I hadn't time to, to, to get through all those. But the audience loved me, and at the end of the thing, they sort of rose to their feet, and I got a standing ovation, and I remember thinking, I like this. <laughs> I like this. But I, mean, I wasn't afraid of the stage. It was a moment of release. Yeah. So that, whatever it is that it allows you, that stepping away from yourself a little bit, uh, it, it it just it just did something for me. So uh, that was a turning point, I think. And uh, uh, who do we have here? This is Lisa. Uh, she says, David's new album is fantastic. We saw him in Bournemouth over the summer. Going to see him in Southampton at the end of this month. His music is not at all miserable. Truly inspiring. Can never get enough new music from David. Very intrigued by the constant bird themes in his music. Gulls, crows, and the current new single as well, of course. Birds of the High Arctic. Birds yeah. of the High Arctic. Yeah, it's... Uh, it, it, they're, it's a, always been a passion of mine since I was a child. I think uh, it wasn't that anyone pointed me in the direction of nature and wildlife, and birds are just a very visible aspect of that, I think, so I latched onto them. I had a bird book that I was obsessed with from the, the moment I could read and look at pictures. And, you know, it's just been there. And then as pictures of me as a child, about two or three making an eagle out of driftwood in Scotland because I'd just seen one. So the, this making process of referencing has always been there, but it's, I guess I've become less self-conscious about it, and it's become a bigger part of my life in the last 10 years or so when I've been going out to Norfolk where we've got a little cottage and sort of seeing more birds and just living more in their world through the binoculars, which is a new thing for me. I love it because there's a sense of obliteration. It gets rid I lose myself in what I'm looking at and thinking about and observing and their behaviours and their, their world and the distances they travel. So anyway, I'm in, totally intoxicated and bound into this natural world and there's not a day goes by I don't hanker to be out in it. That's where I want to be. So that, that, that urge is sort of manifest <clears throat> on this record in several places. Gulls, Birds of the High Arctic, The Incredible. There's lots of songs that seem to have a sort of cellular yearning to be out there in the wild and lose the human world and find another. So I, it's it's a preoccupation of mine and it seems to be getting stronger, not weaker. In fact, there's more feathers coming, I think. Right, OK. <laughs> more, in the next album, look out for all the bird titles on the next album. You're going to play another live track for us uh, this morning uh, from Mutineers. Which one's it going to be? It's going to be... I want all my cake and eat it. Okay. Well, I want all my cake and eat it. Yeah, I want all my cake and eat it. 
Well, I want on my cake and eat it. Yeah, I want on my. Yeah, I want on my. I work like a worm in the furrow. I'll dive like a bird in the wake. I'll live like the rain or tomorrow. 'Cause I want on my. Yeah, I want on my. Yeah, I want on my. Don't know the meaning of. Don't know the meaning of. Don't know the meaning. Don't know the meaning of. Don't know the meaning of. Don't know the meaning. Don't know the meaning of. Don't know the meaning of. Don't know the meaning. Mark Collins here on Wave 105. My guest this morning is uh, David Gray. David, quickly before you go, we've got to talk about your busy schedule up until Christmas. Yeah. Um, you're off to, is it Boston this weekend? I'm going to Boston for a show on Saturday night. Yeah. It's a quick in and out. Right. Uh, and then uh, the European dates uh, start about a week later. That's in Germany and Holland and places like that? Germany, Holland, Switzerland, and then over to the UK for half a dozen shows. Then Ireland. Then Ireland. Uh, and then a couple more in America, so Los Angeles and San Francisco. Before Christmas. Before Christmas, and then then back. So that will bring me back about the 15th of December. I think I've got a couple more commitments before the year is out. So when are you going to get a chance to buy your family their Christmas presents? After that. After, <laughs> your typical bloke, 24th of December, <laughs> yeah, that's rushing me. round it John Lewis. Quiet, <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, now then, the, as you mentioned, part of the UK tour, you're coming to the O2 Guildhall in Southampton, Friday the 28th of November. Um, if if your gig, that's the only time I've seen you at the BIC earlier on this year, is anything to go by, then please do get tickets for David Gray at the O2 Guildhall in Southampton, Friday the 28th of November. Uh, the new album is called Mutineers. Uh, that was out, when was that came out? June, wasn't it? June. Yeah, that's right. And the new single from it is called Birds of the High Arctic, and that's out this coming Monday. Go on the birds. Go on. Go on the birds. Excellent. Right, David, it's been a pleasure to meet you. Thank you ever so much for coming in. Thank you. Thoroughly enjoyed this morning. Uh, We shall finish with the, uh, the brand new song from David. This is out on Monday, Birds of the High Arctic.